Joel? Yes. It I, I not you very your screen. screen. Yeah, you have my screen. It's yeah. normal. It's but normal, but I, I have not begun. It's on the no. I'm in pause. No, you please stop sharing your screen. I will share my screen first. Okay. Yeah. So I stop. Please. Thank you. So let okay. me share my screen. Hey, Carlos. Okay. Is my screen visible to uh, you? Yes. Okay, great. So good evening, everybody. In fact, uh, there is another edition of Surgical Academia. In fact, uh, since uh, post pandemic, all of us have opened up and have been got busy with our work. Maybe uh, now we'll be having it a uh, little uh, in a distant, I mean, that uh, space between the events will be little definitely longer. I think it will be better to have a monthly event now than a weekly. From weekly, we had come to fortnightly. Now, probably we'll be going it a monthly. So, in fact, uh, just to introduce uh, to the new speaker this evening, Professor John Marx is the uh, new speaker to this platform. Professor Joel Leroy is uh, well acquainted with the platform of Surgical Academia. That's uh, this Surgical Academia is purely a teaching learning platform without any commercial bias it had started way back in 2012 i'm just just going as uh, smoothly this is just just was the whole intention of spreading surgical education and training and teaching live workshop classes everything was going on and this pandemic in, in fact has uh, rejuvenated the thing uh, in inviting people and uh, people across the globe from many experts from across the globe have come and joined here so it's the same thing we have cut up in a very different form and today we have an excellent uh, speaker uh, in fact professor joy lera doesn't need any further introduction because he already has presented in this platform maybe this is the third or fourth time he is coming up is the founder and chairman of hanoi high tech digestive center in saint paul hospital in hanoi in vietnam uh, he is a pioneer in advanced laparoscopic colorectal surgery since 90s and he is recognized worldwide as a surgical expert a master educator inventor and a researcher and uh, he has uh, uh, innovated so many techniques and uh, technology for laparoscopic colorectal surgery he is a, was a professor in 1997 uh, in digestive surgery in lilly medical university in france besides he is a visiting professor in many countries so in 2013, uh, this uh, um, event in uh, Society of American Gastroenterology, uh, Gastroent uh, Intestinal Endoscopic Surgeons Conference, Sages Conference, uh, he received this uh, Pioneer Awards in Minimal Invasive Surgery. And probably he is the only non-American to receive this award. And fortunately, I was there when he received this award. And from that day onwards, we are friends. In fact, after my presentation in the same uh, Sages conference, uh, uh, from those uh, is 2013 till 2020-21. I mean, he is a fantastic human being and fantastic educator and uh, friend. And uh, we have been just in touch with uh, in many other events as well. So, uh, Professor Leroy is uh, this is the pioneer award that he received in 2013 uh, with his uh, best people, Armando Melani from Brazil and Professor John Marx and of course uh, many of his colleagues are uh, all experts in uh, this field. So to introduce Professor John Marx, he is the Chief of Section of Colorectal Surgery in the Lincolnio Hospital in Pennsylvania in US and he is MD from Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, Advanced Laparoscopy Fellowship, uh, Fellowship in University of Nice from France, Chief of uh, Section of Colorectal Surgery, President of International Society of Laparoscopy Colorectal Surgeons, Secretary of International Network of Comprehensive Rectal Cancer Centers. And his special achievements, one of the two expert colorectal surgeons in the United States selected to present informational seminar on uh, transanal endoscopic microsurgery at Sages meeting of the Millennium Atlanta in 2000, represented the International Network of Comprehensive Rectal Cancer Centers at a special meeting of NSABP in Pittsburgh in 2000, uh, fellow of uh, so many other associations and numerous other professional societies, innumerable presentations, books, book chapters, his CV run into pages and uh, will take hours to present. 
so with a tremendous achievement and thank you professor laroy and professor marks for accepting my request to come over and discuss two very contentious uh, topics to tonight uh, uh, one is a uh, local resection of rectal cancer following a new adjuvant treatment in fact whether it's a myth or a reality an interesting uh, topic that professor marks will be talking and professor laroy will be highlighting uh, the benign and malignant tumors uh, transanal approach right from uh, down top uh, tme all the time we are talking about the top down tme so he'll be talking today on down top tme and all the benign and malignant tumors where does the world stand now so thank you very much uh, now the screen is, and air everything belongs to you professor leroy you can start your presentation first that will be followed with uh, professor jor mark's presentation please thank you let me first uh, unshare my screen uh, i think uh, uh, could you uh, share your screen professor leroy i'm uh, doing i'm i have stopped sharing my screen okay yeah. you have have you my screen? Uh, no, you haven't. Uh, yeah, it's coming up. Great. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Some uh, technical problem, but uh, finally, it's uh, nice to be together. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to participate to this uh, meeting because I've seen uh, a lot of friends and uh, great friends, old friends. Uh, John Marks first, and the uh, choice of your um, topics is uh, very, very interesting. And um, I have understood that there is uh, some uh, um, uh, language to uh, explain. You spoke of TM, TME, uh, uh, there is a lot of difference. And we have to clarify it for all the participants because a lot are very young surgeons. And um, with John, we have uh, chosen to speak different things. I will speak mainly um, uh, benign uh, disease, intrarectal benign disease, and um, mainly polyp, and um, early cancer. And he will speak. Uh, advanced cancer uh, um, after radiochemotherapy and downstaging probably mm -hmm. and uh, local uh, um, uh, surgery the so uh, it is not a tme if i have well understood that we will speak but uh, local or um, uh, uh, excision even for cancer so what uh, sorry i wish to begin when we have a rectal tumor and we have to resect them we have the different possibility a long time ago surgeon we are doing conventional transanal resection uh, and we know it is feasible but in only in few cases and few localization when we have a specific equipment allows to improve the possibility of resection by transanal way uh, it is better but the most important when we do a resection is to respect technical feature we know that uh, when we do conventional local resection we can uh, do a resection using classical uh, valve retractor as a park retractor for doing uh, excision full thickness excision using a parachute technique using traction with sutures on the tumor but um, as you see uh, um, it is limited at the distal uh, um, tumor or mid rectal but with some difficulties when we Resect, we have to respect some uh, uh, principles. Margin, free margin around the tumor, um, on the um, basis of the tumor, uh, is a minimum 10 millimeters. Using a full thickness resection, 
where we have the tumor and um, unblock resection, not fragmentation, and doing a pathological examination uh, of the specimen we just resect. This change with um, possibility proposed by a friend of uh, the father of uh, John, um, that is uh, Gerard Booth, 40 years ago, he proposed, after a long research, a new technique, uh, after he developed a um, device uh, for doing transanal endoscopic microsurgery. And um, this is uh, a revolution uh, 40 years ago. He developed this product um, with a Wolf company, a German company, and it was a product very expensive, um, using a binocular vision and um, the possibility to um, resect polyp transanally uh, with a very uh, easy manner and um, uh, using uh, uh, four centimeter diameter trocar uh, with different lengths, 12 centimeter and 20 centimeter, to reach uh, the high rectum and doing uh, a local resection, uh, respecting the, um, the principles I just described. And um, it is a real revolution for doing um, um, elegant uh, resection of adenoma, respecting um, uh, principles of resection. With the development of laparoscopy and um, minimally invasive surgery using uh, video camera and uh, laparoscope, uh, equipment was cheaper and cheaper because uh, surgeons use scope uh, with camera, but the camera was uh, also used for minimally invasive surgery and particularly laparoscopy. And uh, um, the transanal endoscopic uh, um, device uh, uh, developed by another German company, Storz, uh, called TEO, uh, is uh, very elegant and uh, um, cheaper than the system developed by Gerhard Buchs. It's not a binocular vision, but uh, we can see very well and we use uh, all the equipment we use in laparoscopy. The only problem uh, or only advantage is having a different size of a tube, um, 7.5 centimeter, oh, sorry, 7.5 centimeter, 15, 20 centimeters, and it is fixed to the operating table with different cup to introduce and channel to introduce instrument to operate, and we have insufflation and scope. Other possibility, other device, other platform, um, soft platform we can use for doing transanal endoscopic surgery. You have the SILS system developed by Medtronic and um, the gel point that is uh, um, a sleeve introduced inside uh, through the anus. And um, also uh, some people propose to use the air seal device. What are the indications of um, the transanal surgery for doing uh, um, uh, resection of tumors? The main indication are polyp, adenoma polyp. But more and more with time and with experience and results, um, we can uh, propose to do early carcinoma, carcinoma reaching the mucosa, the submucosa, well differentiated grading with no lymphangiosis carcinomasos and no vascular invasion with a tumor uh, size less than three centimeter and well uh, easy localization. How we do, you see, we introduce uh, the um, trocar, four centimeter diameter, fixed to uh, arm, 
fix itself to the operating table. We can insufflate to clean and exufflate uh, to um, uh, evacuate the smoke. And the surgeon will have the possibility to use three channels for operating and watching on screen. This is what we can do. Personally, I love to use classical laparoscopic instruments. It's not necessary to have an um, um, uh, angulate instrument, even if we have when we buy the device. But you see, I'm using in this case uh, um, um, harmonic and uh, um, bipolar system uh, that is a system from uh, Olympus. And uh, we um, do the full thickness resection respecting the margin to remove a polyp. And as you can see, the advantage of the TU, it's not necessary to have a high pressure because the TU, four centimeter diameter, is maintaining open the surgical field. This is an advantage of the system imagined by um, uh, Gerhard Booth because the insufflation is used mainly to clean the abdominal, the, um, abdo the rectal cavity. And at the end, we can uh, suture, we will see, we will discuss later, of uh, suturing or not suturing. Other case, we have removed, just removed, you see, after we remove, we pull, this is a uh, four centimeter diameter, so the polyp was four centimeter. And as you can see, it was a posterior polyp just above uh, the sphincter or mid rectum. And we have the full thickness and uh, we are close to the sacrum. And what we can do at this moment, we can let like this because it is posterior, we will see later, or we can suture. Can we do the suture? Yes, as you see, we suture like this, and we uh, do um, suture using running sutures uh, with um, VELOC, for example, or using separate stitches. I prefer separate stitches because, uh, as uh, you see, we have high tension, but it is mainly due to the insufficient that we have high tension, um, and uh, there is a risk of um, uh, um, uh, to open the um, scar at the end. Other indication, this is a submucosal uh, tumor, carcinoid tumor. As uh, you see, we will uh, do the delimitation to respect the margin, and we will uh, resect using uh, uh, Thunderbeat. As I said, it is uh, harmonic and bipolar, and we see the sphincter, and uh, we will respect perfectly the sphincter. And uh, uh, this is one of the advantage of the TO. We can do very low resection, um, respecting um, the anatomy and having the possibility to see very low for doing a good and easy resection. So we will resect completely. Other case to show one of the advantage of doing transanal surgery with the tools we have actually, a sealing device. Because when we have to do large surgery, sometimes we can have bleeding and the question is how to control. And the uh, advantage of uh, tools that are uh, versatile tools, this is a bleeding, no panic. We can coagulate. We use, in this case, um, bipolar coagulation. And we can continue. We can use ligature too and do with ligature. We do a sealing. And it is one of the advantages of the device we are using for doing the resection. Other interest, as I said, 
of the TU. This is a particular device. We are at the limit with the uh, margin, anal margin, and we can maintain open due to the size of the device that is used as a retractor, and we remove the polyp um, easily and probably better than uh, using transanal approach. And as you see, we have respected the margin, as I said. Question is, what we do? We see perfectly the sphincter. We can uh, let like this, or we can suture. Even if it's very low, we can do with the TU. Other technique we can do, as endoscopists are doing, but probably faster than they do, uh, is to do um, EMR um, uh, for uh, doing a very a low resection. And uh, we can do with a perfect vision, we do very fast, uh, and this is ligature advance, and uh, we are using uh, this uh, uh, technique for doing very small resection or very large resection, large um, and polyp, and we will do exactly as endoscopists are doing, but in my opinion, faster, safer, and we will see the distal uh, limit and uh, um, do the resection uh, with uh, EMR, not doing a complete full thickness. I'm uh, going faster to show that it is a real uh, EMR. We have uh, preserved the rectal wall, and this is the end of the resection that we have at the end. And when uh, we have uh, finished, we can do a sutures as uh, 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 the endoscopist cannot do. You will tell me why doing? Perhaps to reduce the risk of uh, stenosis, perhaps to, you, to reduce the risk of infection or inflammation. And it is important, and we know when we have done the local uh, resection, particularly uh, when we have a cancer, and if we have to do a TME postoperatively, um, we have to wait a long time because there is a lot of inflammation and it is uh, uh, surgically more difficult than uh, uh, doing um, uh, um, primary TME. But this is the possibility we have when we do the um, uh, transanal approach. Other interesting case. This is a this gastrointestinal stromal tumor of the anterior wall of the rectum. We did the diagnosis with the biopsy. Is a, it is a six centimeter diameter, uh, and the patient had the prostatic uh, symptom. And um, finally, he went to see me, and we, I did the diagnosis of this uh, big tumor. And um, we proposed first a medical treatment to reduce the volume. And uh, it was uh, three months, new evaluation, not enough downstaging, but good downstaging. And after six months downstaging, we had uh, a reduction of the volume and uh, half, uh, less than half of uh, one third of the volume of the beginning. And we decide to operate the patient. We put the patient in prone position. And as you see, we have uh, the size uh, anterior wall visible with the tumor. We can see, and I did uh, the 
D section with a limit like this. The danger is for the urethra, you can imagine. We will have also to dissect close to the prostate at the upper part, but we go slowly and we see very well, I think it was a good indication better, in my opinion, than doing a surgical procedure from up to down and to avoid also to do, if we do up to down, probably we will do a TME and uh, doing uh, the surgical approach by transanal, uh, we will see perfectly the limit of the tumor, the capsule we will have and we go slowly this is a spatula from uh, Junji Okuda. It's a spatula with a channel, a hole, to evacuate the smoke. And you see we have a cleaning, rapidly a cleaning, and uh, it's very low. It's close to the um, uh, anal canal. It's why if we use the other type of device than the TO, it's more difficult because the seals, the um, uh, sleeve uh, uh, introduced inside will be um, above the sphincter and we will not have a beautiful view for dissecting. So we continue the dissection from down to up and uh, going slowly and we will reach the prostate. You will see soon and uh, we go slowly to be sure that we will not injure the urethra and uh, we have to do a complete resection with a margin uh, free. We can do hemostasis too and uh, we use the monopolar, we can use bipolar too, but I love using spatula because we um, uh, do a dissection sharp dissection. We are, you see the prostate probably, distal there, the prostate was behind and uh, we have the prostate and we will resect. Now we see very well the prostate and uh, this is uh, where we will be at the end. This is not a, pro a prostate, is anterior. This is the prostate and we have the fat around it, just above uh, the um, um, tumor, the gist, uh, we have to resect. And finally, we will resect this uh, tumor uh, with the um, uh, rectal wall, as you see now. And uh, we will have R0 resection no envision at the limit of the tumor. This is the hand, as you see, it seems easy now and safe. And we have to do the suture, finally. We will resect first, we remove. We remove the It's not too big. It was a three centimeter diameter. Um, and now we will do the sutures after we complete the mustasis. This is what we have at the end. Question. Um, intraperitoneal entry. There is a um, anatomy, particular anatomy of the rectum, anteriorly above nine centimeter, we will have a risk if we do full thickness to enter inside the abdominal cavity. So the full thickness area is this one, mainly posterior, a little anterior, avoiding to go too distal. So main danger is there and we have a risk to enter inside the abdominal cavity by inadvertent, 
or intentional. When we know that it is anterior, we can do avoid if it is a cancer or a suspicion of cancer. And this exists in zero to six percent of cases. What to do in this case? We can do the, a suture, we can do a laparoscopic sutures if it is anterior, or we can do open or laparoscopic low anterior resection, but it is exceptional when we have skill. Risk of descent when we do sutures. This will occur in 0 to 20% of all cases, particularly following uh, lower rectal resection, uh, very large one. Symptom last during six to eight weeks. Butyl uh, rectal pain, ache, fevers, nine sweets, bloody mucous drainage are the symptom. The pelvic sepsis is uh, not uh, uh, often. Um, but this can uh, arrive in uh, low rectal lesion. What will be the treatment? Oral antibiotics and analgesic. What uh, we know with the literature, in case of perforation into the peritoneal cavity during transanal endoscopic microsurgery for rectal cancer, so early cancer, is not associated with major complications or oncological compromise. What to do when we have a um, um, defect? Close or not close? There is a, a randomized controlled trial from Ramirez, published in Colorectal in 2002, and he found no difference concerning postoperative uh, bleeding, stenosis, and wound healing in uh, um, uh, similar at uh, four weeks. Fecal incontinence. It was evoked due to the use of a big uh, trocar, four centimeter diameter trocar, that can uh, uh, provoke uh, um, sphincter damage. This will occur in 1 to 5% of patients. Usually, it is uh, only just uh, soiling, small incontinence to flatus. It is transient and results in few months. But avoid to do this surgery in patients with um, um, uh, sphincter um, uh, damage and um, uh, trouble. I um, will speak uh, of perhaps a development, as uh, John will speak after radiochemotherapy, of uh, local surgery for rectal cancer. Only to know um, that uh, TME is the gold standard today. But the question is, can we do rectal preservation using uh, local approach? in cancer. Um, mortality risk is very low by transanal and morbidity too. But when we do local excision of the cancer, we have no lymph nodes staging and we don't know, we know, but we don't know perfectly the local results. This is a patient, 50 years old, male patient. He had during uh, three years, local excision of benign poly by endoscopist. It's a doctor and uh, it don't wish to have a large excision. The endoscopic said to him, all the biopsy are negative, but uh, it's uh, difficult for him to do a new resection. And he went to have a local excision, don't wish to have a TME. We have not the diagnosis of a cancer, but a suspicion of cancer uh, due to the recurrence. And I decide to do a large local excision, but I have a doubt. There was a small node, perhaps inflammation in contact with the scar or the um, uh, recurrence of polyp. And I did. Uh, as you will uh, see, 
euh, segmental, rectal, resection, circulaire. And this is what I have called the distal TME, removing all the fat, all the meso around it, from um, mid distal rectum to the eye rectum. So I'm uh, doing a resection of the rectum, and uh, it was in 2010. And uh, June 2010. And I did a complete resection, as you will see, to have the possibility to analyze the nodes and uh, the polyp. And um, remember, polyp biopsy, multiple poly biopsy were negative. This is a colorectal junction. I'm uh, dividing the junction, and uh, I will have finally colon, open, resected, and distal is the rectum. This is the end of the section. Probably now I will use more uh, um, sealing device as a ligature. I'm removing more fat. Laterale, you see there the colon. I'm re resecting more fat, more meso, to do a better analysis. And I have to do the connection. So I will do a suture, colorectal sutures. And at the end, you have a rectal, you see we are just above uh, the anal canal, and we do a circular anastomosis with separate stitches. Results. It was a T2 cancer with uh, one, node, one node positive. I removed 15 nodes. Postoperatively, the patient had radio chemotherapy. He accepted to have this. One year later, he had the hepatic metastasis removed by surgery. And uh, 10 years ago now, the patient is always alive with good functional results. So, as I said, TME is a gold standard. Other possibility, we will not speak today because it is a TME and pure transanal TME, only to say that it is in development, but I'm not, it's not a local excision. And the goal is to have uh, in the future perhaps no scar. Conclusion, transanal endoscopic surgery increase indication and results to cube rectal benign tumor and early cancer comparing to traditional open surgery. It is technically demanding necessity to have training and equipment due to design equipment and skill developed with surgical laparoscopic training. Surgeons are more and more able to perform transanal surgery, reducing extant rectal resection, improving functional results with faster recovery. But training must be done in advanced training center with experts. Go to see John. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Larai, for that wonderful talk uh, and opening up all the, uh, the scenarios uh, that you can be comfortably done trans and early. I think you made uh, uh, look, the surgery look so easy and comfortable in the trans and all route. Uh, I mean, uh, people have been doing it uh, for quite some years, but uh, I think it's not gaining that momentum that it should have gained. But anyway, uh, I think you have made things much clearer that uh, these uh, polyps, uh, the sessile polyps, uh, even the malignancy, they can be attempted. And further, we are hearing, we are just waiting to hear uh, uh, Professor John Marks about his views on uh, local excision of rectal cancer following a new adjuvant uh, CTRT. 
So, uh, Professor John, it's over to you to uh, say us whether it's really a myth or a reality. Well, thank you very much. Joel, I think you have to stop your presentation. And then hopefully this will work. That was a wonderful uh... I was watching you speaking, John. Sorry. <laughs> okay, let's see here. I think perhaps Leroy, you will agree with me that uh, it all depends on uh, your training and expertise in dealing with the transanal surgery more than that of the uh, uh, surgery itself. I think the technicality and uh, getting acquainted with the transanal endoscopic surgery is probably much more important to go ahead and do all this uh, starting off with sessile the polyps and going ahead is the way forward. So Manaj, can you see my presentation? No, oh, it hasn't come till now. So that's why I'm just uh, taking up time with uh, Joel. No, it's not come up. I think. Uh... Hmm. Could you just uh, share it again? Please stop sharing and do it again, please. Yeah. What was your question, Manash? Sorry. Uh I mean, uh, it's uh, better to uh, somebody want wants to go ahead with a transanal endoscopic microsurgery. Then you should okay. ideally be starting up with some sessile polyps and gradually go ahead. Uh, that's what you suggest. Yeah. I think. Manas, can I say a word? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It, it, it is a wonderful surgery, Manas. I've done a reasonable number. Mm -hmm. Technical difficulties are there. Mm -hmm. As Professor Roy said, one must learn from an advanced lab, I mean, endoscopic center, endosurgery center. Mm -hmm. And uh, only problem comes, as you mentioned, staging of the cancer. Okay. Sorry, I'll, I'll switch off. So, is this presenting yet? Uh, no, no, it hasn't come yet. Uh, probably after you are clicking, uh, uh, please, uh, please stop sharing so that uh, I will just uh, go it once again. Please stop sharing, and we'll go from the beginning. Yeah, now you click uh, present now. Then uh, click on the entire screen. So it says okay, to after, me sharing after now. That, after that, you again click on this uh, screen and then share. That probably you are not doing this, this final step. That's why this problem is coming up. Yeah, no, I'm doing that. So what do you have? I got it to work the one time, but fire screen. Uh, uh, entire screen. Then after that, click on the uh, whole screen again. Then say. Yeah, I did that. It's showing John Marx is presenting, but suddenly after that, uh, it's not sharing, in fact. Uh, I tell you, I'm going to try and sign off and back in again. Uh, I don't yeah, know why. I, I think you that will be better. Please uh, sign off and do it again. That will be better. In the meantime, we'll be discussing with uh, Joel. That will be better.
is bias your research color is there with you yeah professor uh, joel in fact uh, by the time uh, john joins back uh, so okay. we are not discussing about uh, if uh, you are uh, planning to start a transnasal endoscopic microsurgery what's the way forward what's in your view one should uh, start and what's uh, how you should uh, take this up uh, as i said in my conclusion uh, it's uh, important to work um, and to have a mentor in uh, uh, advanced laparoscopic center, colorectal center, where they are doing transanal surgery. Uh, in uh, my center, I teach, and my young uh, uh, assistant are doing more and more, doing local excision, mm -hmm. doing sutures. I teach them how to do sutures. And... Um, as you have seen and you have understood that I'm using uh, a TU device and people are saying, oh, it's not so good than having uh, uh, seals, uh, gel port, uh, uh, or other uh, device. But believe me, when uh, you have very low um, um, uh, rectal polyp, uh, it's not easy. And it's not myself saying, because uh, my friend, um, um, uh, Frédéric Bretagnol, you said to me he's uh, connected and perhaps he can speak, I don't know. But um, I think Frédéric was, was there. Frédéric was there. I don't, probably he has left the meeting. He was okay. there. Okay. Uh, he said to me that uh, he cannot do with uh, seals or with... Uh, uh, gel port or other device, soft device, because uh, they are hiding the distal part of the rectum. Okay. So to learn how to do uh, manipulation through a small trocar, it's not complicated. It's uh, learning, uh, practicing, and it's uh, very easy, in my opinion. Okay. And when we have understood that the uh, Troca, okay. the big troca mm -hmm. is a, a good uh, device for exposing. It's not, we are not using insufficient for working. Remember only Gerhard Booth, he was working at the extremity of his device. And okay. it is obliquous. And he was working um, on the uh, inferior part of the um, uh, troca. So it was always exposing. A insufflation was not for doing a dilatation of the colon and the rectum. It was cleaning the space working. Ah, John will do it. No. I think John is getting that problem of sharing, maybe. Anyway, uh, you sold. Uh, uh, both gel port as well as the stores uh, transanal endoscopic microsurgery. Uh, uh, you started up with uh, the gel port, and do you find the gel port is uh, comfortable than the other? No, no, I said no. no. No, for me, for me, no. And it's very expensive comparing to the yeah, TO. It, uh, TO is a reusable product. It's not a reusable one, absolutely. And Prasanna, sir, you were telling something. I mean, <laughs> yes. your experience. Yes. Yeah, most of the cases I use the seal sport. Okay, the same seal sport that uh, for the yeah. seal surgery that's been done. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I I usually prefer one articulated instrument. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's in so fact that, you know, yeah, that, the same one. Non yeah, that, correct. No, it's and, interesting because seal sport. I, I have shown distal tumor. I have shown tumor just above the sphincter. How you do when you have this type of tumor? You cannot. You, cannot. you have to free first without, and you put it after. But after, you have to suture or not. So you say, I never suture. This is easy. I believe, and uh, 
Frédéric Bretagnol was never suturing before, uh, seeing me doing, and he said, uh, uh, since he's suturing, post-operative time, ah, ah, it's good now, uh, yeah. post-operative time uh, is better. Okay, okay. I mean, it will be surely a difficult scenario when the tumor is situated lower down than uh, in the mid rectum. And the posterior tumors are easier, to, I mean, better to start off uh, than the anterior ones. Uh, right, right, yeah, right, yes. Yeah. Okay. I agree. So, uh, I agree. In fact, uh, ready? So, no. yes. Normally, normally no. Gerard Bush were saying, if we have an anterior tumor, we put the patient in prone position, and you have seen a patient in prone yeah. position for the gist. Uh, yeah. uh, if it is a lateral tumor, we put the patient on lateral side. And uh, why? Mm -hmm. I have understood the trocar is using is open for working down. Okay. That's That's so, uh, John, okay. you're ready now. I think everything is fine. You can. Yeah. Sorry story. about that. No, no problem. Absolutely, we are not. We are busy discussing uh, Joel's presentation. So, absolutely well, no. Problem. Please go ahead. Well, Manaj, congratulations for putting this together. And um, as I look at the audience, there are people from around the United States and Central America, uh, Lebanon, Abu Dhabi, Europe, and Asia. So, congratulations for the world reach for this. And it's always a pleasure to speak after my good friend uh, Joel, and it's always daunting to try and follow him, but uh, it's my pleasure to speak on uh, local excision of rectal cancer after new adjuvant therapy, myth or reality. So here are my speaker disclosures. I'll speak to whomever wants to speak with me. Usually they're pretty nice. Uh, hopefully you guys will be kind to me. So uh, for any of you Looking to visit, we're at uh, the Lankin All Medical Center, which is just outside of the city limits of Philadelphia, built on an old golf course. And uh, we have a training center, uh, and we're happy to, to accept visitors once this COVID crisis gets under, under uh, control. So, you know, I'm talking about local excision for rectal cancer after new adjuvant therapy. And... Uh, it's really appropriate that what we're really speaking about is organ preservation for rectal cancer. And so it's appropriate that I would be speaking to you with this watercolor of my fair city of Philadelphia as a background, as um, this is a painting of my father, Dr. Gerald Marx's, and uh, really a lot of what I'm going to speak about comes from the work that he and Mohammed Mahoudin pioneered at Jefferson in the mid 80s. So really what I'm gonna to talk to you about is uh, over a 30 year experience of full thickness local excision for select rectal cancers after high dose preoperative radiation therapy and where do we stand? So if you ask a couple of seasoned surgical oncologists, what's the ideal treatment of rectal cancer? What they would say, and I think everyone would agree, is that you would control the cancer with good function and, out, and with no colostomy and minimal morbidity, mortality, and trauma to the patient. And so what we're really talking about is can we have a better, oh boy, did I just cut off there? How come I can't see it? Better quality of life for our patients. You know, and I put these two people here, and it's worth noting the fellow to the left is Stuart Kwan, who pioneered at Sloan Kettering. He's the one who discovered that adenocarcinoma of the rectum was radiosensitive at a time when it was taught in medical schools that there was no effect of radiation on adenocarcinomas. And the fellow next to him is Dr. Gerald Marks, my mentor and my father, who uh, I've been in practice with. And he's the one who pioneered sphincter preservation after high dose radiation therapy. And, you know, I've had the benefit from the very beginning of my practice to be in practice with him and gain his insights 
and build upon that. And this is what I'm gonna share with you. And here we are in our office, the map behind us of where the patients have come from around the country and the world. So this is what we're talking about. Bill Heald in the 80s highlighted the primacy of good surgical technique on cancer control. And as Joel properly noted, the benefit of this was not to cut across the cancer and to take out all the lymph nodes. That being said, there's a cost for it. And this is the rationale for, sphincter pre for organ preservation is the high morbidity of TME. Uh, there's significant LARS. All these patients with low tumors have a temporary stoma. And APR rates are up to 50% in many parts of the world. So can we do better? Well, the background really is, can we take advantage of neoadjuvant therapy with chemo radiation to downstage the rectal cancer and change our surgical options? Can we get higher complete response rates? And then, as Joel noted, when Gerhard Boos in 1983 developed the TEM, it increased the notion of we can reach into higher places and extend transanal local excision. And this was a seminal paper published in uh, 2008 in Disease and Colon Rectum by Moore et al. And, and really what it was showing, and this is not surprising, is with endoluminal surgical techniques, in this case TEM, but this would also be the case, I think, with TEO and TAMIS, and that the challenge from below is how do we get to the proximal margin without tearing it. And so what you see here is statistically significant benefit of clearer margins and non-fragmentation of the tumor uh, when we're using TEM. And then, you know, this is pooled data looking at survival benefits. When you can convert someone to a complete response with no pathologic remnant, those people have survival benefits uh, from the rest of the group. So what about watch and wait? We've all heard of this. We basically have the Brazilian experience from uh, Angelita Habergama, uh, who's shown here. This is her and Rodrigo Perez. That's the Brazilian team. And this is my partner, uh, Henry Scunyung and I. So this is the merger of the two teams. I'm gonna share with you some of the data that they have uh, and this is me down in uh, Gama's and Angelita's office in Brazil. Uh, and really, we've shared a great deal. And their data dates back to the uh, late 90s. And it's really looking at these CR rates of 27% of all the cancers. So about a quarter of the cancers, they were able to convert to a watch and wait with good local recurrence. Well, what happened when we looked at that? more broadly in the world. Uh, this group from Holland beats Tan and uh, her husband was showing in looking at 100 patients, a local failure rate of 15% in these patients. Uh, this is Nancy Baxter publishing in Lancet showing roughly the same, a 16% local failure rate. This is in a pooled group, uh, lower disease-free survival in the watch and wait. And then rule humpies in looking at uh, what happened when they failed and you had to take them back, uh, over 50 to 60% of these people are having APR. So there's definitely a significant human cost for those who fail, and there's a higher failure rate with watch and wait. Most concerning, honestly, was this report from Sloan Kettering published uh, two years ago in JAMA Oncology looking at roughly 10% of their patients who they watched and waited, uh, what they found in those groups was a 21% failure rate with a significant increase in metastatic disease in the patients who failed and a lower disease-free and overall survival in the watch and wait compared to the complete response TME group. So when you put this all together, it begs the question of watch and wait. I mean, it's promising if you are right, but when you're not, and it's significant, about a third of the patients are not, you, you have a high cost in terms of survival and the need for permanent colostomy. 
So is there a different way? How do we merge local excision with all this? And, you know, that's what I'm really very happy to uh, speak with you about is my perspective on organ preservation for rectal cancer. And this is a perspective that goes back to the mid 80s. Uh, and it's worth noting that in uh, over a thousand patients, our sphincter preservation is 93%. And this is something that's static, it's held up over time. And about a quarter of the patients we select for full thickness local excision. So what I'd like to focus on in terms of endoluminal surgery, because I think that might be a better term than TEM, TEO, TAMIS, all of these are using devices and now the robot uh, to do this. And when is endoluminal surgery enough? Is this an option for stage two and three cancers? Is this actually safe after chemo radiation? And what about higher up? Is it safe to get into the peritoneum as you all have spoken about? And then lastly, is this a road to notes? So, you know, you can't have this conversation without talking about our dear friend who's now departed, Gerhard Boos, who in 1983 developed this at a time before there was even laparoscopic surgery. And what we're talking about is as Joel has so nicely shown, the ability of these instruments to give us access not only to the distal rectum transanally, but higher up. So historically, in 1984, uh, our unit was the first ever to perform a local excision after preoperative radiation therapy. And you have to understand that it was just a decade earlier that it was considered malpractice to operate on the radiated rectum uh, and try to do sphincter preservation. And the questions at that time were, would the wounds heal? How would the function be? And what's the cancer control? So we've certainly shown that this heals. And I'm going to take you through some of our published data. And this is when is enough enough. So neoadjuvant therapy can downstage cancers. And uh, what we're talking about is if you do a local excision afterwards, what happens? So, uh, you know, we published, and it's important to note in terms of a complete clinical response when there's nothing mucosally based and there's no feel whatsoever, the tumor is different than what you normally have which is in duration in the wall. And those are all patients who, in my opinion, should have full thickness local excision. Everyone should recognize that the Brazilian group does this. They, they term this, and I think this was a translation issue, they term this a biopsy, but this is really a full thickness local excision. So when you do this and you have residual tumor in the muscularis propria, is that enough or does more need to be done? So we looked, our protocol has been to that bowel cancer confined to the bowel wall, that was adequate. So we looked at our database uh, over this period of time uh, and it's worth noting that all decisions on how to treat the cancer were based not on the stage on presentation, but on the decisions were based on the cancer after completion of chemo radiation. And if the cancer was regressed to the bowel wall less than four centimeters in size, we offered local excision as an option, saying that radical surgery was still recommended if there was a YPT3 or node positive in the specimen. Everyone's not built the same, and you have to recognize that the morbidity in this type of patient or this type of patient who's about as round as he is tall doing a TME is very different. And so perhaps in those group, we'd be even more apt to use a good oncologic approach uh, that avoided abdominal surgery. So we identified 47 patients who after chemo radiation resec resection had YPT2s, uh, there was significant downstaging from the T3s, but also some upstaging. And 
you know, this was over a long period of time. So some of this was before we were using chemotherapy. We generally treat to 55, 80 centigrade or more than 50, uh, 40 centigrade. And this is what we're talking about. This type of downstaging from the original presentation here to this scar afterwards. And, you know, this is the type of uh, resection we sometimes do. As Joel noted, you mark with a one centimeter margin circumferentially around the tumor. Uh, I'm using the TEM equipment here. We're taking a full thickness excision here. And this was quite a large excision, uh, which ended up being really almost a uh, sleeve resection. You can see we have the entirety of the mesorectum out underneath this. This is what it looked like. Uh, and then this is what we had left. You can see the pubo rectalis here. And then we put stage sutures in and close this as Joel uh, so nicely noted. Here we're using the silver clips for the TEM to help with the closure, but there are other ways to do this. And this is things at the end. Um, you know, in these patients, we had no mortalities. As spoken about, there is some wound breakdown. In my opinion, all of these wounds need to be closed. This is not something that Joel was talking about, that these can be open. You have significant problems if you leave them open. Uh, local recurrence was certainly higher than we would see in our um, uh, radical resection group. Uh, but when you look at the patients treated with chemo radiation, and use TEM surgery, the local failure rate goes down to four and a half percent. And there's a, there's a significant difference between uh, transanal excision without chemotherapy and TEM. Overall survival is 85%. And so, you know, with optimal therapy, this is a significant way to go. This is a real possibility for T2 and less cancers. And I think is a reasonable, this is reality, not myth. So, is it useful for stage two and three cancers? Uh, again, we went back and looked at things for this group. Same thing, identified 66 patients. This is our treatment algorithm. All unfavorable cancers, uh, which are defined as T3 or node positive and those in the distal half of the rectum undergo chemo radiation, generally to 5580 centigrade. And then after a week, after an interval of three months time, Sphincter preservation is performed on all patients except those patients who have a fixed cancer after completion of the radiation therapy in the distal three centimeters of the rectum. And so we're talking about this group of patients with local excision. Again, that's about 25%. And this is what we found in this group. So this is what we're talking about. Uh, three quarters of the patients, the inferior margin was above the four centimeter level. And uh, again, this is broken down into our earlier and later experience. Uh, two thirds of the patients said TEM and what you'll see is that these patients did better. And this is what the pathology looked like. These patients here with YPT3 cancers were then recommended for radical surgery. So overall with a five year uh, follow up, a local recurrence rate is 9%. Again, uh, better in those who had chemotherapy and radiation compared to just uh, chemotherapy, and better in the TEM patients than the non-TEM patients. The overall five-year survival, 78%. So again, this leads us to conclude that for the select patient properly selected, the oncologic results of TEM are better than transanal excision. And with chemoradiation and this, if you have proper downstaging, this is a reasonable option to afford your patient. So uh, this is a paper we published uh, looking at this, the issue of wound dehiscence. Is it a problem and what do you do? Again, we found, uh, we looked at 62 patients who had uh, wound complications and in the radiation therapy group, uh, it, this was 25%, whereas in the non-radiation uh, group, there were no patients who had wound dehiscences. So of the wound dehiscences, 
Nine of these were minor, treated simply with oral antibiotics, and two were major, uh, one of which required a diverting stoma. But the vast majority of these patients were treated with oral antibiotics. It took three to four uh, weeks to uh, heal, but they did quite fine. So not surprisingly, wound complications after TEM uh, and TAMIS are higher in the radiation group than in the non-irradiated group. Uh, however, they can be done without difficulty. Do not prohibit TEM excision, full thickness local excision after neoadjuvant therapy. And then lastly, how about higher up? Is it safe to enter into the peritoneal cavity? Uh, you know, this we published, um, uh, I think in 2009 or 11, and this is my overall experience. You can see that we have a significant experience uh, doing this, and it's over time that we looked at this. So we looked at our first 300 patients and found 26 of them that we went into the peritoneal cavity. And it's worth noting to the young surgeons, this is something you avoid in the beginning. Uh, really, in the beginning, we prohibited uh, excision anteriorly for the higher lesion, so I only had a 3% entrance, and these were usually very small entrances. And then by now, you know, if it's available, we'll go into the peritoneal cavity without much uh, fear because we have much more experience in closing these things. And this is sometimes this is something that I'm talking about. Uh, this is showing a significant entry into the uh, peritoneal cavity anteriorly. This particular patient uh, was a benign lesion, but you can see we've taken the entire wall, and you can see how big one can resect things uh, transanally and how big the specimen you can take out in this fashion. But for this patient, uh, they went home uh, the following day uh, with no abdominal incision uh, whatsoever. And you can see you can close this up uh, quite nicely without problem. So uh, of the patients that we went into the peritoneal cavity, 14% of them we did diverting ostomies, and these were really done electively in very high-risk patients. Uh, this was more because I was concerned that if we had a problem with the patient, they wouldn't survive it, and they'd be better off with a, a diverting stoma and heal, and then close this uh, later. None of these patients required an emergent uh, expiration. So, and there are no mortality. So, uh, and I think it's also worth noting that none of these patients was there any carcinomatosis. So um, entrance into the peritoneal cavity during endoluminal surgery is acceptable in experienced hands, but it should be something that's done only after you have significant experience. And we should be able to offer this in high-risk patients because they have the best benefit for local excision. You know, to talk about how things have been done um, internationally uh, and around the world over time, we're not the only people working in this space, of course. Uh, the first one who did a study was Emmanuel Lozoki, who uh, looked at T2 cancers, and he set up a uh, trial after chemo radiation comparing local uh, TEM versus uh, uh, low anterior uh, resection and found no difference at all in the local failure rate. Of course, there was a major difference in terms of those who needed stomas. There were no stomas in the TEM, and uh, half the patients uh, had either definitive uh, or permanent stomas uh, with radical resection. More recently, the Grecar trial has been done. Uh, they were looking at uh, small T2 and T3 cancers who downstage from uh, a four centimeter or less tumor to begin with to two centimeters. They defined acceptable pathology as a downstaging to complete response or T1, YPT1. And they were randomized as such. And uh, what they found here was a local recurrence rate of only 5% and good disease-free survival. Their conclusion was that it's oncologically safe to perform local excision on select cancers. 
completion TME, if you have a failure, is morbid. And positive lymph nodes are rare after uh, chemo radiation therapy for small tumors. And it's all about really the selection criteria. If we could be more selective, clearly local excision would be better than TME. And this is where we're moving from myth to reality. You know, the Habergama group has looked to increase their complete response rates by giving chemotherapy in the interval between the completion of radiation therapy and the de decision for uh, surgery and have pushed rates up to 50% in that regard. And this is the new GRECR-12 trial, which is looking at now induction chemotherapy before radio chemotherapy. And what they're trying to do is push things to a 60 to 80 percent. So 60 to 80 of 100 patients with rectal cancers, they're trying to see if they can get them to have local excision as opposed to radical resection. So we'll have to wait and see with that. The Star Trek trial uh, is looking from Denmark, is also looking at this. Uh, and, you know, we don't have these results as of yet, but they're looking at different radiation courses uh, followed by transanal surgery compared to uh, surgery straight away. So I think there will be uh, more information coming, and it will be coming relatively shortly. How about a road to notes? Well, you know, there is new technology on the way, and for the last couple of years, uh, I've been fortunate enough to have really the first uh, robotic single port device available. So this is through a 25 millimeter scope. So this is a little smaller than the uh, TEM scope and there, there's binocular three-dimensional vision as well as wristed articulation for three arms to work. And this gives you a lot of functionality uh, that we never had before. You know, I think worth noting, and this is a, uh, a case of a, a large polyp which turned out to be a very superficial T1 cancer. So you can see how beautifully you can see things. You don't have to worry about positioning the patient on their belly or back or side, depending on where the lesion is. You have the functionality of the bipolar grasper and the scissors. The three-dimensional view is really uh, phenomenal here. And if you look down here at six o'clock, there's this hologram which shows you the positioning of the three arms. So in this particular patient, I'm operating in the plane between the muscularis propria and the perirectal fat, because if there was a more advanced tumor, I had already decided in discussions with the patient that we would proceed with the low anterior resection. So I didn't wish to uh, go deeper and jeopardize that plane. So here we are coming all the way around the tumor. And really, uh, this is a level of comfort and ease for the surgeon and visualization for the surgeon which is remarkable. There are other ways to do things, of course, but I can tell you if you have this available, uh, let me tell you, if it's in your hands, you're always gonna to wanna to use it. This is just using the bipolar at the base of the polyp uh, to take it out. And usually it's the last bite where the blood vessel resides and that's uh, good to control before you come across it. So, this is what the defect looks like. You can see how nicely uh, our margins are. And then in terms of, in terms of suturing uh, in this fashion, again, not everyone has the incredible expertise of a uh, Joelle Lewis, uh to sew end aluminally. Um, to have the wristed dexterity of the equipment um, really makes sewing intraluminally very easy. Tying is very easy. You don't need those silver beads. You don't need a V-lock and you don't need some type of external device. All of these are very effective, but I can tell you having spent a lot of time doing these cases, the ease and comfort 
of operating uh, with the SP robot and Illuminally is going to open up avenues, in my opinion, uh, to do things that to date we as surgeons have been hesitant to do. You can see how nicely you can see things. And this is just showing us uh, running a uh, Vicrol the other way. This is something that Joel was talking about using the uh, flexible ports from below. You lose some of the, this is done through a Tamis device. And then this is just closing things uh, at the end. The assistant device is then used to remove the uh, needle without difficulty. So in conclusion, I would say that for rectal cancer, organ preservation after chemo radiation therapy is a reality. One must be selective using smaller tumors. Uh, the evidence for doing full thickness local excision, and it must be full thickness local excision as opposed to watch and wait is stronger. Uh, the standard for T2 and small T3 cancers remains a TME, but with proper research and study, I think we're going to see expanded use of local excision and watch and wait in these cancers. And if we have that, in America, where there are roughly 45,000 new cancers a year of the rectum, we would be able to change in up to 24,000 patients a year the care of their rectal cancer to avoid abdominal surgery whatsoever. So I'd say to you, endoluminal surgery will expand for rectal cancer with morbidity that's acceptable and good oncologic outcomes. It has to be done carefully with proper training and more importantly, proper judgment. And in my opinion, the SP robot and TAMIS will expand the field remarkably. Uh, for those interested, from Springer, we've published a book on many of these techniques that Joel was talking about, uh, as well as me, and uh, I think it's an excellent uh, training device. We're proud of Mank and all of what we've added to the surgical tree for rectal cancer management. And I'd like to take this opportunity to share with the group, the Society, the Multidisciplinary International Rectal Cancer Society, uh, and invite you to Philadelphia uh, next spring uh, after we've got this COVID under, under control. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. It was my pleasure to share this with you. And it's always a pleasure to be uh, uh, with Joelle. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor yeah, John. Uh, a wonderful talk, in fact, I must say. And uh, you have really uh, given an eye-opening presentation of uh, how uh, in a select group of uh, rectal cancers, uh, a local excision is a reality. It's not a myth. And in fact, uh, Professor Joel is also equally very happy hearing all this. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, it's... Uh, is now open for uh, discussion. So, sure. yeah, uh, I think anything, any comments from you, Professor Joel? Uh, co congratulations, John. And, uh, you know, it's a fantastic lecture. And um, I sh hope uh, everybody understood that it is a uh, uh, necessary to learn how to do transanal surgery. It's not accessory surgery. When uh, we have a colorectal uh, department, colorectal surgeon doing transanal uh, surgery for a surgical uh, uh, team in uh, a colorectal uh, uh, um, expertise, it is uh, very important to have people uh, with um, eye training in uh, this uh, technique, surgical technique. 
I think I think is it the reason that uh, transcranial endoscopic surgery is not uh, gaining the momentum as it should be? It's just because of the uh, expertise, the uh, technical expertise, and it is is it technically demanding? Is that the reason uh, that uh, probably it's not gaining the momentum that it should? What's your comments what? on this? Uh, yeah, I, I, I yeah. think I think originally the problem was that. Wolf, who made the device, their equipment was only made for TEM, and it couldn't be used for laparoscopy, which okay. they then expanded. Uh, but it lost a lot of the input. Stewart's has excellent equipment, and I think the flexible ports transanally have opened this up for other people, uh, but it makes it somewhat, I don't think the, the view is as good that way. And um, I, I think there's a lot of hesitation uh, because people don't see a lot of these. They see a few a year, and so they're not comfortable with it. And uh, I think when you put all of that together in specialty centers, there's a lot of enthusiasm, but across the general surgical uh, curriculum, many people don't have the expertise or interest to get good at it. Okay, okay. So I, I think uh, as uh, we, the time goes by, maybe uh, with uh, exposure and slowly with uh, polyps and the benign surgery, maybe somebody can slowly attempt onto the malignant procedures as well. So what pressures actually, what gas pressures you really use, uh, both of you, Dr. Joel and Professor Marx, uh, while doing the transanal endoscopic surgery? Uh. I have not quite understood. Sorry. I mean, what what pressure do you use uh, while doing the procedure? What pressure? So, what gas pressure do you use? The insufflation pressure, pressure that I said is usually 15 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, it can be a little lower, uh, yeah. and optimally, I like to use um, the SurgeQuest device, uh, which has a more constant insufflation pressure, uh, as opposed to um, some of the other insufflators that go on and off and, and create a bellowing of the field. Mm -hmm. How about you, Joel? Um, uh, as I said, uh, uh, I'm uh, using as a concept of the uh, heart booth. Uh, I explained that it is a big trocar that is a circular retractor, mm -hmm. a particular shape at the extremity with um, obliquus. Uh, the uh, operator is uh, normally working down, not working circular. And uh, all the pictures we have from uh, Gerhard Booth, uh, the drawings, show very well that he is working down. And as I said, when it is anterior tumor, he was putting the patient in prone position. When it was a lateral position, he was putting the patient in lateral position, always for working down. And the pressure is interesting, but I have understood that it is not a pressure that it is important, I'm uh, working uh, with a pressure between 10 and 15. But it is a cleaning, continual cleaning of the field. And because um, um, retractor, the TEO, the tube, is maintaining open the space, and I'm working at the extremity of the TEO, uh, I can work with a clean, um, uh, surgical field and we have not discussed of that but I suppose it is what we see regularly or people what they are saying how you do to have a perfect visual uh, uh, space uh, surgical field why it is always clean how you do for the smoke first I try to use a, a device that are doing less smoke as you have seen but I'm also cleaning in continuum. With the TO, you have insufflation and exsufflation. So your pressure is not very high, and you maintain the space open due to the 
um, shape of the device. Okay, okay. So the pressure and is not and when I do, for example, transanal TME, mm -hmm. if I do posterior dissection, lateral dissection, anterior, I'm pushing the TO as the endoscopists are doing the submucosal dissection with the cup. They are maintaining open the space and they are working at the extremity. So this is a circular retractor. Okay. I mean, I mean, somewhere or other, you just want to uh, uh, mimic the procedure that uh, the endoscopies they are doing, as if they are also uh, injecting adrenaline at the base of the sessile polyps and uh, doing a EMR. You also follow the same technique. Uh, what I saw in one of her video. You injected adrenaline uh, in, into the best. Was it the adrenaline solution? Was it that? No, no it's, it's not adrenaline solution. It was not saline no, solution. It's not saline solution because okay. electrocautery will not work. It was um, 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 uh, water. We do. We put water, or you put uh, you put a solution as the endoscopists are using mm -hmm. um, to um, um, uh, um, what it is. Uh, I don't remember to um, to lift to be sure that it is not lift some mucosa mucosa so that it become better uh, go for an endoscopic mucosal dissection. Yeah, yeah. I would, Nash. I would say that um, this is something that we've done in the colorectal field for decades, uh, and it's something that we as surgical endoscopists are the ones who introduced it to the endoscopy world, and. Uh, this is something that's done routinely for the deworm resections and for submucosal excisions. Uh, and it's very helpful to raise things up. It's important to make sure that you're in the proper plane. And once you're in that plane, it is helpful. But as Joel said, um, with electric cautery afterwards, sometimes it makes it a little uh, more difficult, but th it, that, that's a great way to proceed if you're doing a submucosal excision. Okay. And, and as regarding the as regards the closure of the defect, uh, it's it's not always uh, that you close the defect. Uh, in my hands, it's pretty much always. I mean, maybe five percent of the time I wouldn't close it, and okay. usually that's for someone who has a very large yeah. uh, circumferential submucosal excision, and you just physically can't for those big carpet lesions. But the Discomfort the patients have, the decrease in bleeding and the re rapidity with uh, healing make me want to close all of these. And frankly, if you want to do anything bigger than just small submucosal excisions, you're going to need to know how to sew in this space. So I would advocate for those getting started to be able to do that and work on that because it will expand things for them as they proceed in this field. And you are not a fan of those v logs Statafix, nothing like that, the ordinary suture that we use for any other closure, you also prefer the same, is it that? I mean, uh, v logs fine. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it, but it's fine. Okay. Okay. Joel, also, you also follow the same principle? Yes. The majority of them, you don't prefer closing the defect. Yeah, I, I, I have uh, discussed and I have uh, explained. Personally, uh, as John, normally I always do. Okay. And uh, particularly if we have a doubt or a large defect, mm -hmm. um, because if, as I said, if uh, we have to do uh, postoperatively um, uh, TME, mm -hmm. uh, large resection, people will tell you. Uh, when we do transanal surgery, it's uh, difficult to operate the patient after for doing TME. And it's probably yeah. due to uh, inflammation, uh, due to local infection. And you limit the risk of uh, uh, inflammation if you close perfectly. Okay, okay, okay. So I think, uh, is there any other questions from the floor? I think both the both the talks were so mesmerizing that uh, everybody has really you have opened up the facets of how transanal endoscopic surgery is uh, really has got its future. How uh, we are doing uh, in the benign tumors, and uh, John has uh, really uh, opened up and 
the son the things that how uh, it's a reality in the select group of patients uh, of uh, ca rectum uh, but uh, i think uh, any any other comments that you have uh, mm -hmm. for somebody that who plans to start off uh, the procedure i mean apart from getting the expertise training equipments that's obviously need to be there i mean i think that um clearly when you get started uh mm -hmm. you're better off dealing with tumors that are in the low rectum so that if you ran into a problem you could do something transanally and get out of trouble um start okay. with small lesions that are posterior uh mm -hmm. start with benign lesions and then mm -hmm. as you build experience with that then you can venture into cancers and then cancers after chemo radiation therapy and it should be a stepwise approach like that uh mm -hmm. so that you're not hurting people uh while you're developing your personal expertise absolutely absolutely as the points well taken that i mean you have given the catch uh, how to go ahead i mean professor joyly you want to add on to anything else to this no <laughs> okay okay that's great uh i think uh, all your cases uh, before being uh, posted for surgery you are, they undergo the same a uh, bowel preparation that uh, also is being quite often done uh, for tme standard uh, laparoscopic tme yeah we're definitely prepping everyone before you're doing these you don't want to have stool in your face as you do this yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely fine so i think uh, that was a wonderful time uh, spent today evening with uh, professor john marks and professor joy lara it was a really fascinating time hearing both of you and uh, you have really opened up uh, the frontier to go ahead with transanal endoscopic microsurgery maybe we'll be meeting at uh, 2022 professor john marks in that uh, conference uh, to get more enlightened on the uh, what the progress that the world is having on transanal endoscopic microsurgery so it was a wonderful time hearing both of you thank you very much for accepting my request to come and present uh, your thoughts and share your wisdom with uh, all of us and thank you every participant that uh, they spared their time uh, and joining us uh, today evening so it's a pleasure to have both of you today evening thank you very much for uh, sharing your time thanks, thanks a lot joel always a pleasure yeah it's it's a big pleasure um, for us manash great job <laughs> thank you thanks thank you okay okay sure sure thank Are you, you for john i be in touch manash <laughs> yes now it's office hours for me yeah okay. yeah uh, from uh, for john it's morning and uh, from said lara it's evening <laughs> and for it's us good it's good evening night. for me yeah and for us it's night it's dinner time <laughs> and yes. John, this must be uh, uh, it's too early it is yeah. uh, uh tea time tea time sure. okay sure. okay Take so we next time we can uh, that's for some other session as well thank you very okay. much thanks for joining bye bye take care and thank you very much namaste thank you namaste thank you